Welcome to Meet Me at the Intersection of Housing. I am extremely excited about this conversation. We have what I have um, said, a gem to the housing justice and community development space. The wonderful Lisa Rice, who is the president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> Hello, Shlan. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump right on in. Um, as I said, you're the CEO and uh, found, not founder, excuse me, president of the National Fair Housing <laughs> Alliance. Um, so folks know that. Um, but what I'd like to, to create space for today is for you to share a little bit about your journey, um, share a little bit of the breadcrumbs that have led you to this work and, and to this role. Well, Sean, I started out in the, really in the fair housing space when I was a teenager. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I landed an internship uh, at the Toledo Fair Housing Center in Ohio and started working with that organization under the directorship of the great Shauna Smith, who is a legend in the field of civil rights and fair housing. Um, and it was just really a blessing in my life that I was able to meet such a dedicated soldier and warrior in the fight for justice um, at a young age. I, like many other people, had members of my family who worked in the, the field of civil rights. My, my mother's first cousin was a youth organizer for Dr. Martin Luther King um, and other members of my family uh, played leadership role in the, roles in the civil rights community. Um, so I, I don't know if I really recognized at the age of 15 that this is something that I really wanted to do, but I certainly was drawn to the work, excited by the work and, and really juiced, jazzed by the wonderful things that the Toledo Fair Housing Center um, was doing. Like I was just totally blown away that people could go undercover, so to speak, and perform investigations to ferret out discrimination and, and literally do something about it and change the world. Um, for me at the age of 15, that felt so empowering, right? It felt like you could control um, your world. You could control the communities in which you lived. And, and I, I think maybe, Shlan, um, that kind of activism resonated with me because that's sort of fundamentally who I am. I'm not a complainer. If I mm -hmm. see something I don't like, I just like to try to do something about it, right? Okay. That's fundamentally me. So that's how I got started. Mm. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Now, tell us something about yourself, Lisa, that we we don't know. Well, I don't think that most people know that I um, am a trained artist. I got my undergrad degree in fine arts. I'm oh, supposed wow. to be painting on the shores of Ghana, not, <laughs> <laughs> oh, not doing this work that I'm doing. But um, uh, yeah, I was a fine arts major. Uh, I, my specialization is drawing. I went to grad school, I went to school in France, uh, Village des Arts en France, um, uh, and worked with some, some great artists who were a part of the existentialist movement, uh, worked with Jean-Paul Soutre, Gertrude Stein, uh, Pablo Picasso, uh, Paul Brock, and, and other great abstract artist. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I'm supposed to be painting on the shores of Ghana now. <laughs> oh my goodness. I did not expect that. <laughs> oh my I God. know people, nobody knows that about me, except for people who've known me for a really, really long time. I used to design uh, clothing, um, was a fashion designer for a while. 
Yeah, and then this civil rights bug just really, really bit me hard. Have you ever um, had an opportunity to blend the two worlds? And you know what? You know what, Shlon, that's an interesting question. So yeah, I do blend the two every day because in this work that we do, we have to use the arts in order to convey a lot of the messaging uh, to convey the, uh, uh, to communicate with people in myriad ways. So we yeah. use the arts in the civil rights space quite frequently. Uh, not just in the social media content that we develop, you know, the flyers that we use to get the word out, but in in the way that we put together books, publications, uh, different mediums to uh, educate people about this work, about the sector. Um, but we use songs, we use different uh, artistical mediums. We use plays, we use musicals. We we use, right, the whole kit mm -hmm. and the poodle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, there's something that I want to, to ask you, but I'm gonna save it towards the end. Um, okay. But but we'll come back to that because um, I really want to get your 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 thoughts when you talk about how we communicate um, this work. Um, so some of you that are tuning in right now, we're speaking to Lisa Rice, who is the president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance. And some of you may not know that Lisa has been a contributor of Shelter Force. Um, Shelter Force reports on affordable housing, the community development movement, housing justice. And, um, and not too long ago, actually, um, she uh, wrote a piece long before redlining racial disparities and home ownership need intentional policies. And I appreci appreciate the word intentional because when I was reading the article um, at every, <laughs> At every juncture of the development of this country, there were systems, laws, rules put in place intentionally keeping black and brown people out from creating wealth, especially when we talk about home ownership. And so when we think about this new year um, mm -hmm. and it's 2024, we've definitely made some strides. Um, it is an election year, but what should people directly and adjacent to this fight for fair housing, be paying attention to. Sean, that's a that's a great question. I, I and the first thing that that comes to mind for me, I I um, just got back from vacation, um, and while I was on vacation, um, people had been pinging me because um, Dr. Gay. Uh, Claudine Gay at Harvard had resigned because of pressure, a lot of pressure from ultra conservative white supremacy groups um, that did not like the fact that this black woman was leading uh, one of the most revered institutions in our country. And I was quite saddened by that news when I left to go on vacation. It was just coming off of the heels of having contributed to a very broad uh, Amigas brief strategy to support the Fearless Fund mm. that has been attacked by people who oppose uh, racial equity. Uh, and, and so uh, what I feel, you know, um, very presciently at this moment is that there is a strong pushback and a, a strong onslaught against racial equity issues, civil rights issues. People are saying the quiet part out loud. They're not afraid of it. Um, the uh, This election year will be profound. It will be quite impactful. It will dictate whether or not we put back in to uh, into leadership, a person who uh, is very bold about being anti-civil rights, anti-equity, anti-justice, anti-righteousness. Uh, and uh, I think what it, it 
issues for us is a clarion call to double down on justice, to double down on the truth, to double down on protecting our democracy and our freedoms. And um, I think it's important, Shlan, that, that we recognize that we're just not in a position of fighting back or, or playing defense against these assaults, mm. uh, that we can still play offense mm. in this time. So can you can you go a little bit deeper into, into that um, when you talk about playing offense? For folks that are tuning in, what what might that look like? You know, Sean, it's got to be a multifaceted approach, right? So one of the things that we see uh, with respect to these attacks on racial equity, uh, attacks on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts, one of the things that we see very clearly is a narrative shifting, right? People are mischaracterizing what racial equity really is. They're, they're saying that it's reverse discrimination, that it's racism and, and all of these things that it really is not. So part of our offensive strategy has to be doubling down on telling the truth, amassing and, and uh, developing, creating our own communications campaign and strategy where we are telling the truth about racial, what racial equity means. We're telling the truth about what justice means. We're telling the truth about what uh, civil rights means. That, that kind of an offensive strategy can be extremely powerful because words carry power. Yes. Right? Words actually are the sort of precursor to what happens in the concrete. So words can be, they may seem abstract when we're talking, but they actually manifest in very concrete ways. Mm. That communication strategy is, is, is very important. We also have to be uh, taking the lead and playing the offensive when it comes to developing our own systems of equality. We have to do that. And, and, and I know that we're going to talk about that in a minute when we get into more discussion about the AI work, but we have to be taking control. We have to be uh, taking the mantle when it comes, taking up the mantle when it comes to creating products, services, mm -hmm. innovations that provide the access to opportunities that we all need and that we all want. Right. I uh, and then I'd also say that we have to continue the offense, uh, offensive strategy of attacking discrimination when we see it. And we mm -hmm. have some very powerful civil rights tools that enable us to do that. And we have to keep utilizing those tools so that we're stopping discrimination in its tracks. And we're implementing systems and uh, and programs that are fair and equitable and provide opportunities for everyone. Mm. Oh my goodness. We could literally <laughs> go so deep on just right, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> the hairs are standing up. <laughs> right, Sean. Right. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this train moving and I don't want to derail derail us. Um, but you did mention, you know, us sort of taking, taking that power by creating our own, um, and something that I think is extremely, um, intriguing is this, this, uh, conversation around AI, um, and how, you know, you have, you have both sides. So you have the, the negativity, then you have the positivity, you know, so people are, I feel like we're going like this, you know, we don't know which way, you know, we should go in regards of utilizing it. But what I see is your organization leaning into this. Um, and so can you share a little bit about um, why your organization um, is leaning into the AI um, and how, 
and because we hear, you know, some conversations around using the technology to combat biases. So can you talk a little bit about that? And then I would love for you to give a shameless plug about your upcoming um, symposium that's happening uh, soon. I'm happy to do that. And um, I don't I don't mind shameless plugs. Trust me, Sean. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, one of the things that like you mentioned the article um, at the at the top of this conversation. And one of the things that that I point out in that article, Sean, is just what you said, that we are we are unjust we we have an inequitable society on purpose it is not a mistake that our communities are still racially uh segregated it is not a mistake it is not a mistake that we are more segregated today than mm -hmm. we were 100 years ago that's not by accident it's by design we are segregated by design it is not an access, it is not an accident that we apportion resources based on space, based on place, based on geography. It is not an accident that Black communities are in the same city, in the same zip code, are 10 to 15 degrees hotter than predominantly white communities. It is not an accident that uh, black communities disproportionately are grappling with things like climate injustice, environmental injustice. It is not an accident that we have a dual credit market in which mainstream banking institutions are disproportionately located in predominantly white neighborhoods and payday lenders and other higher cost lenders are disproportionately concentrated in communities of color. It is not an accident that banks today, Schlan, are closing their branches in high income affluent communities at a higher rate than they're closing their branches in low income non-Black communities. That's not a mistake. It is not by accident that we have zoning ordinances that restrict the ability to build affordable housing, both at the in the rental sector and the home ownership space. It is not an accident that we have algorithmic models, automated systems that perpetuate bias on a daily basis. That is not by accident, wow. it's by design, right? We have all these systems. It's not by accident that our appraisal system generates bias and, and devalues homes in predominantly Black communities and predominantly Latino communities. That's not by happenstance. It's mm -hmm. on purpose, right? Uh, over the course of, of our nation's history, we have implemented literally thousands of laws and policies that were race conscious. Mm. race conscious, right? Race based that created these systems of inequality. So these systems of inequality, like our dual credit system, have generated all kinds of data and information that mm -hmm. I like to describe it as, you know, these bits of data that have a patina, they are cloaked in bias. Mm. And we're seeing that, that, um, tainted data to then uh, infuse into the algorithmic models and systems that we're using in tenant screening selection systems, in credit scoring systems, in automated underwriting systems, in risk-based pricing systems, in digital marketing systems and the like. And all of these systems are manifesting bias. Uh, so a number of years ago, I, I mean, the the National Fair Housing Alliance has been working on algorithmic bias since our inception. Let me oh, make wow. that right. So in the 1990s, for example, we were suing insurance companies for implementing discriminatory insurance scoring mechanisms. But that work really has picked up and sort of morphed over the years for us. Uh, uh, not quite 10 years ago, but we began a really extensive investigation 
um, because we started receiving complaints that Facebook's uh, marketing platform was discriminating against people of color, against women and other underserved groups. We launched an investigation. We ended up having to file a lawsuit against Facebook. And it was really in the throes of that litigation, Shlon, that I think it really hit us that technology is the new civil rights frontier. Mm. If technology is the new civil rights frontier, then we're the ones that need to be designing it. Right. If if we're if we're really going to take our lives and our destinies in our own hands, then we have to be the ones who are designing the technology. It, uh, Sean, we started out at, at, at NAFA's inception of restricting the use of technology. So if you look, if you go back and look at our early insurance redlining settlements, what we say in those settlements is ABC Insurance Company, you cannot use your insurance scoring system. Mm. You cannot use your uh, automated underwriting system. So we restricted the ability of those institutions to use the technology. Mm. We litigated the Facebook case I mean, we were just overwhelmed with the reality that technology was going to take us over. Like, we can't continue to do cases where we're restricting the ability of entities to use technology because the technology is already here, right? right. And it's just going to grow. So that means we have to develop it. We have to shape it. We have to model it. So we launched our responsible AI division and our tech equity division and so our team of data scientists and engineers uh, and, and policy, uh, uh, policy experts are designing, uh, they're engaging in research, and they're also designing technologies that help humanity rather than hurt and harm humanity and communities. Got it. And you yeah. asked me to give a plug, so I got to give a plug. Yes. <laughs> we will be hosting the first responsible AI symposium. It will be held here in the nation's capital, January the 18th and 19th. Please join us. I don't know if there's a way for us to put a link to the uh, symposium registration page uh, in, in a chat so that the viewers can see that, but we'll, we'll figure out maybe if we can do that. But if, if we can't, if people just go to our website nationalfairhousing.org and put responsible AI symposium in the search box, you'll find it. We, we have an amazing roundup uh, lineup of speakers, Schlan, from all of the heads of the financial regular, the Prudential Financial Regulatory Agencies, Chairman Grunspan, uh, Comptroller uh, Michael Sue, Governor Michael Barr, We'll be doing a special panel talking about how the federal regulatory agencies, the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, are uh, uh, addressing algorithmic bias issues. Uh, we have different officials from the White House who will be talking about the new Biden administrations, uh, Biden and Harris administrations, mm -hmm. uh, uh, AI Bill of Rights. Uh, we'll be having representatives from the tech industry. In fact, Facebook will be there. Meta will be there. Um, we 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 have a different relationship with them these days. No, I mean, I I, I think um, what I, what I love is, you know, um, we can't we cannot do this work in in silos, right? So we're gonna have to put our feelings to the side <laughs> and keep our eyes on the prize, not to sound cliche, um, and, and work together, you know, because there really is benefit for all parties that are involved, right? Um, and so, you know, um, I love what you said about technology is the, is the new civil rights frontier. And I hope someone 
wrote that down <laughs> because that was so that was um so powerful um but from this 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 work around ai um and even from the event what do you hope folks walk away with um during that time well uh Shlan, one of the important the critically important things that we're doing is lifting up how agencies can voluntarily implement all of the elements of the AI Bill of Rights into uh, their operations, right? So a lot of people may want to do the right thing, but they just don't know how. And so we are hoping that as a part of this symposium, organizations and entities will come away with an understanding, a, a more fulsome understanding about all of the elements of the AI Bill of Rights, but also uh, have a keen awareness of about how they can start to utilize different tools to implement these different elements of the AI Bill of Rights. And we want people to more fully embrace tech equity, right? We want them to embrace this idea of responsible AI and responsible AI is a it's a packed word. It includes making sure that systems do not harm people. Mm. It includes transparency. That is a tough one because a, a lot of entities have not been transparent about the fact that they're collecting our biological, our bi biometric data, mm. that they are collecting information, our financial data, our health data, uh, they haven't been transparent about how they're using that data. They haven't been transparent about how it's impacting us. Um, we we want people to come away with responsible AI includes making sure that systems are explainable. So if someone has used a tenant screening selection tool mm -hmm. to deny you housing, do you understand that decision that was made and do you understand how the decision was made and do you understand what you can do to rectify it mm -hmm. right so it, it contains all of these elements systems have to be trustworthy and then the thing that I really love to Shlan is there has to be a human alternative mm -hmm. what if the credit scoring system is not working for me right <laughs> You know, what if it's getting me wrong, right? Is there some alternative, a viable alternative for me so that I'm not locked out so that I can still get the opportunity for the job, so I can still get the opportunity for the credit, so I can still get the opportunity for the housing, right? So I can still have these opportunities that are important for me. Mm, that's good. That's good. So um, folks, you're tuning in uh, to our lively discussion with Lisa Rice. If you have any questions uh, for, for us to ask Lisa, please put them in the comments and my team will get them over to me so that we can ask Lisa. Um, so thank you for sharing. want to switch a little bit because, you know, going to the conferences even listening right now, um, when you literally listed a litany of things that are not on accident, that are on purpose, um, this work could be discouraging. Um, mm. And so what keeps you going? Well, that, that is a great question, Shlan. I It reminds me of a colleague of mine uh, who is in the same industry you're in. She's in the communications field. And um, she was a, a, a um, reporter, a, a news reporter. Uh, and she faced a lot of challenges because she was the only Black woman at the news station. Mm. Uh, and she, one of the things that she said that has really motivated me is she was feeling sorry for herself one day 
And then she said, just something came to her like that said, you know what, your, your parents, your mother, your father, your grandparents, your ancestors dealt with worse things than you're dealing with today. And not only did they survive, they thrived. They figured out a way to fight the injustice, to overcome it, and to and to still thrive. Like, talk about <laughs> walking and chewing gum at the same time, right? <laughs> um, one of my sheroes is Harriet Tubman. I, and I have to tell you, whenever I get discouraged, I think of that woman. So would, right. you, say, would, would you would you threaten the people <laughs> like either you are coming? <laughs> well, <laughs> if the shoe fits, <laughs> if the shoe fits, Sean, yeah. I mean, right. We have we have to um, we have to uh, think about what we as a people have overcome. Yeah. But we as humanity have overcome. We have to think about how we as civil rights activists, human rights activists have right. made the world better. Right. Right. And and we should think about um we should think about and marinate on our wins. And we've had many, many wins, right? Women have the right to vote. Do you know? <laughs> how hard it was to get that right to vote, right? We have overcome Jim Crow-ism. We have overcome all of apartheid in America. We've overcome slavery. We've overcome all forms of genocide, attempted genocide. Mm. Well, and in some cases, successful genocide, mm -hmm. right? But as humanity, we found a way to advance the ball and try to make the world better. And so we all have a responsibility to continue in this fight, to continue the advancement. And what really encourages me, Ishlan, we have been able to make these advancements because we came together. We decided, we figured out that we were stronger together, that it really does take a village. And so I am buoyed by these multiple collaborations that I'm seeing, right? Mm -hmm. And they're multifaceted. I mean, they're they're um intersectoral. The 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 workforce uh movement, the union movement is working in tandem with the civil rights movement. We're working in tandem with the consumer protection movement. Uh, we're working in tandem with all different kinds of movements in order to unite our yeah. forces mm -hmm. to advance the ball for justice. And I think that's very, very powerful and, and something that we have to continue to do. We are stronger together. We are fighting, fighting back against, um, you know, efforts to divide and conquer us. And we have figured out that the divisionalism doesn't work. I love the way that our Latino brothers and sisters and our Asian uh, brothers and sisters and our native brothers and sisters supported the Black Lives Matters movement. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and not only did we um, come together in that moment, but when our Asian brothers and sisters were attacked at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the black community came to the aid of the Asian community to say, no, we're not gonna have this violence against our Asian brothers and sisters. So that unification is very strong. It's very powerful. And I hope that we keep that going. Mm. Thank you for that. So <clears throat> Lisa, um, I gotta get in. I know we're, we're running close on time. Time, but um, I wanted to circle back before I go to some of the questions that are in, in the chat um, about uh, the way that communication, the way that we are communicating uh, the mm. issue. And so um, I, I, I can go so many places, but I really wanted to know from your, from your perspective, um, what is it that we, uh, folks that are, you know, um, leading the narrative, folks that are finding different ways 
um, to get the information to folks that are fighting this fight. Um, how can we do a better job to be more digestible? Because, you know, as we come up, um, upon the election year, uh, folks are saying, especially folks of color, like this politic talk is not working for me. You know, I don't understand it. <laughs> um, you know, how can we go about making it more digestible and and more relatable um, so folks can use like you said, like we talked about, you know, so that they can be empowered uh, to to make decisions and to to make moves and waves in their own communities. Well, you know, Shlon, you know, I I think when it comes to issues like that, we have to recognize what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. Right? My my strength isn't understanding necessarily how to convey messages to different segments of the community. And so that's where I, you know, call up you. Shlon, mm -hmm. how do I say this? What do I say? This is what I'm trying to say. How what's the best way for me to say it? Um and 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 it's why the work that you do is so incredibly important because you give a voice to these narratives that need to be put out there into the atmosphere. And you help us understand how to how to convey that information in different ways. Um, it's why we appreciate the the uh, musicians and the singers and the, right. the poets and it's and and the artists. It's it's why we appreciate uh, uh, people who have all of those skill sets because they figure out the way to carry the message and convey the message in these different formats in which people can can take that information and 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 use it right and understand it and feed on it. Um, you know, Shlon, before the COVID pandemic, one of the things that we did on a regular basis is we, we used to sponsor annually a poetry slam. Mm -hmm. And we brought in poets from all across the country, well, all across the world, actually, to compete in our poetry slams and, and to convey these messages to different audiences in ways that they really could understand them. And these poems were so powerful, Shlan. Mm -hmm. I mean, knock you to your feet. And these poets said... <laughs> Uh, they they convey these messages in ways that I had never heard before. Mm -hmm. Really, like knocked me off my feet, uh, and that's so important. And we we would replay the poems, and we would get them out there. We would replay the performances so people could see them. And so, Shlan, what we started doing is at our conferences, and we still do, do this today. We have a cultural ambassador at the National Fair Housing Alliance. His name is Pages. And Pages comes and he performs I, for I the pleasure. Of, yeah. At your last it, conference, I had the pleasure. Uh, oh, of, did, isn't mm -hmm. he amazing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just the way he puts words together. Like he, I think um, at one conference, he was so powerful. His performance was so powerful. When he finished, the audience could not speak. Oh, wow. The entire audience, you know, over 500 people couldn't say a word, right? And so we have to embrace all of these different forms. Right. Yeah. Right. And it, it's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to support our artists. And I try to support our artists in any way that I can. I buy art, artists hanging up all over my walls, <laughs> everywhere you look, um, because it's important. It's important that we support the arts because yeah. these artists say things in ways that we could never say them and they get the message across. Right, to the people. All right, so thank you folks for, for um, indulging. <laughs> Um, but back to um, the questions that are in the chat. Um, it's This is from Shelby, one of our staff members. She said, hi, Lisa, thank you for being here. It's been a two-ish been a two -ish years since the nation's biggest bank pledge to contribute billions to address racial equity. 
I would love to hear, especially in light of the new weak CR CRA rule, how you think the financial industry and the corporate world in general has done in keeping those promises. You know, I, some organizations have um, done a great job in keeping those promises and some and others haven't. It's been a mixed bag, to be honest with you. And <clears throat> organizations struggled with, embra with embracing this whole concept and idea of racial equity, of gender equity. They, they did struggle. Uh, and I think organizations in the face of this onslaught, these attacks against racial equity, DEI, um, they're, they're struggling still. And part of our job, as I see it, is to help these organizations understand how they can continue to advance the ball in the face of these attacks. I mean, you can imagine you've got a racial equity program or a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging program. And then you get a letter from Ed Blum saying, I'm suing you. Mm. Um, that's a wake up call, right? And so organizations have to figure out how to navigate that, how to fight back, how to not capitulate. Uh, and I think it's our job and our responsibility to help them figure that out. Mm. Thank you for that. And then the last question um, that I have is um, your reaction to the legal challenges that have been brought against CDFIs for lending programs that explicitly try to close racial wealth gaps and the effects of the affirmative action decision on fair housing advocacy. Uh, that's an excellent question. And it is one that we have been trying to um, communicate about what did not help us, Sean, is that you're not the editor of <laughs> the New York Times and <laughs> and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post and you know all these other um, entities. Like they should just create one job, Sean, where you're the editor. You're like <laughs> the super editor of every single media outlet in the world, because what happened was media outlets misconveyed the message about the Supreme Court's affirmative action decision. And what the public saw were just a litany of headlines that said affirmative action over. Supreme Court um, you know, stamps out affirmative action and thinking right. that's not what happened. That's not what the Supreme Court did. Hmm. So there was a lot, there was a huge miscommunication campaign about the Supreme Court case. And part of what we've been doing is right framing that case and explaining to people exactly what the Supreme Court said in the case. What the Supreme Court said was that Harvard and the University of North Carolina did not convince the Supreme Court that their particular affirmative action programs met the high standard for strict scrutiny as it relates to race conscious or race-based programs. If you want to use a race-based program, you need to have a compelling justification for doing that. And the Supreme Court didn't think that these two entities uh, um, uh, successfully convinced the, the court that they had a compelling reason for uh, using race as a part of the decision-making process. Now, having said that, CDFIs are nonprofit organizations. They are supposed to be mission-driven organizations. CDFIs can establish a program to meet a particular societal need. And so part of, our, of my job, Sean, is to help protect those CDFIs who are coming under attack by the likes of Ed Blum and others of that ilk, um, because we have to uh, help these organizations understand that they do have the right to mm -hmm. serve a social need and address a social need that exists in our society. And we can't lie about the existence of the need. Like we, we can't lie and pretend that black women have the same access to uh, um, venture capital funds or, or funds 
equity funds to start businesses that white people do, because the reality is they don't. White Black women receive less than 1% of all venture capital funds. We don't have the same access and we're not going to lie and say we do. Mm. That is a need that exists in our society and CDFIs are there to, to address and meet that need. Mm. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we are at um, the end of our conversation. Um, Is there anything else that you'd like to share um, about the intersections of housing and and your work uh, that maybe we might have um, missed. John, you know, I'll I'll close out by saying something that I say often, and that is where you live matters. Absolutely. You're you're because of apartheid practices, because of segregation, and the unequitable distribution of resources. Where you live determines everything about you, including your health outcomes and how long you will live. Mm. And so we have to keep our foot on the gas pedal of righteousness. We have to keep our foot on the gas pedal of justice. Uh, We have to keep our foot on the gas pedal of equity so that we can create the society create a society in which everyone can thrive. That is so critically important. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I really appreciate you joining us today for Meet Me at the Intersection of Housing. Folks that have tuned in, I know you I know you are walking away with some nuggets, some gems. Um, so stay encouraged. Um, and until next time, um, you all continue the fight. Um, Thank you so much, Lisa, again, for joining us. Have an amazing rest of the day. Thanks, Shlon. You too. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.